Okay. Um, we will begin, and if you note um, and notice that we will be beginning a few minutes early, um, hopefully um, it just gives us an opportunity to make sure that we um, can address any kind of questions and have great dialogue with an esteemed panel here on this uh, very, very important topic. Um, to give you a little bit of a understanding of how and we're, we're going to be conducting the panel, um, we will be having the Prime Minister speak uh, first about some of the recent developments and, and give their perspectives on it, have, open it up to the rest of the panel, have some questions, and then about halfway through, we will be opening it up to all of you to ask questions to anyone on the panel. And then, of course, we will be closing it with some summary comments. Uh, this topic is immensely, immensely important, so uh, feel free to ask our esteemed panel any kind of questions you would like. Uh, with us today is Prime Minister Dombrovsky from uh, La La Latvia. Good morning. Uh, Prime Minister Thorning Schmidt from Denmark. Uh, Dr. Ernesto Zadio, uh, Director of uh, Yale Center for Study for Globalization, and of course, past President of, of Mexico, and Dir Director Zhu, uh, Director of Managing, uh, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. So a tremendous panel that is absolutely able to, to really discuss this in, in great depth. Um, when I think about this topic, and the company that I'm associated with, uh, we have about 70% uh, of our business in Europe. So, so it is an immensely um, important topic um, inside Europe, but also the effects of it outside of Europe. Um, you can't speak about the global economy without this topic coming up, whether it be a social context, economic context, or political context. And, and Europe is becoming, and appropriately, really consuming the conversation regarding what is going to be happening with global debt and global uh, growth. The Eurozone um, is absolutely a large and open trading uh, block that has benefited from world trade. For example, the Eurozone trade area alone with China increased over 300% in just the last 10 years. So it has truly um, been brought together as an absolutely large economic trading zone. So with that, um, all of this tremendous amount of information um, that can be read in the, in the papers, we'd like to distill it a little. So uh, Prime, Prime Minister uh, Dombrovskis, uh, if you could please give us your sense of some of the most recent developments, how it's going, and put a little perspective on that, uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, well, uh, thank you. So as regards uh, recent uh, developments in uh, Eurozone on some uh, uh, decisions taking, I think there are some uh, issues and uh, some uh, directions where which are fundamentally right and uh, which I think will help to overcome uh, the crisis. We'll deal with the origins and uh, reasons of the crisis and also will uh, help to solve the so short-term problems. So first of all, as regards uh, reasons of the crisis, I think one of the main reasons of this crisis was that uh, uh, within Eurozone, basically there were no sanctions and control mechanisms. There are master criteria which are supposedly to be followed by uh, Eurozone countries, but unfortunately the lack of sanctions and control mechanisms meant that uh, most of the Eurozone countries were just ignoring master criteria and most of them were not meeting master criteria. So what has done uh, over the uh, recent months or a year or so that those sanctions and control mechanisms had been uh, re-established, making sure that Eurozone countries help to uh, stick with their own rules. And also uh, another important uh, decision which has been taken is so-called fiscal compact or treaty on uh, fiscal discipline signed by all uh, Eurozone countries and uh, many countries outside Eurozone, including Latvia, uh, which basically limits structural budget deficit to 0.5% of GDP. So fundamentally showing that uh, Europe is committed to uh, fiscal discipline. Uh, but then there are short-term aspects of the crisis. Uh, uh, often it's discussed, okay, that's all nice, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we have a problem now. We have a problem in Greece, we have a problem in Ireland, in uh, Portugal. Probably we will have a problem in Spain, in Cyprus, maybe in Italy. So uh, what to do about this? And uh, what the problem was basically is that market was uh, questioning uh, the size of the firewall or the size of the money 
there to uh, combat the crisis or to provide uh, bailout programs uh, to uh, affected Eurozone countries. And as long it was uh, just Greece, Ireland and Portugal, one could say those are relatively small countries, so EU can manage with EFSF and ESM, European Stability Mechanism. But once the question started about Spain and even about Italy, uh, those countries are uh, probably too big to be bailed out by those traditional mechanisms given uh, uh, the situation that the uh, full-scale bailout would be needed. And I think most recent decisions which have been taken by ECB on providing unlimited uh, uh, bond purchases for countries which have requested formal bailout program uh, could help to deal with this problem. Uh, of course, uh, there are critics which are saying it's basically printing money, which it basically is. So uh, it's very important that ECB is cautious with this instrument and that fiscal discipline is not forgotten and that really it's uh, strict conditionality which is applied to the country's bailout programs as it is now. It's being applied also to the future programs but then having ECB in the background would remove these questions of the markets. Is there enough money in the firewall? And uh, will it be enough? And will EU leaders be willing to uh, do enough? This ECB action actually helps to deal with this question. And I think the very fact that there is a credible uh, firewall now uh, will reduce market pressure on those countries. So I think uh, there are decisions which have been taken both in a, some medium and longer term perspective and decisions which are being taken in a short term perspective which should lead Eurozone out of the crisis. And we know we are also entering much broader political debate on more economic union, on banking union and so on. But that's, I think, uh, the debate which will be continuing but which is not right now to resolve the current uh, crisis. But that's more for the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prime Minister Thorning Schmidt. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, I want to make three observations um, uh, this morning. Um, first of all, make no mistake, uh, Europe and the Euro is still uh, in a crisis and uh, we have a situation which is far from satisfactory. My second observation is, uh, is this, when you travel in the world, in the States or in China, people always, when you say you come from Europe, people always look at you in a sad face and say, what is Europe going to do? And um, my message today, my second observation is, uh, Europe has already done a lot, um, and we should not talk the efforts of the European leaders down in our uh, discussions about uh, the Euro. And my third observation is uh, that we are all in this together. But let me take it uh, from the top. First observation, the outlook for the European economy is uh, bleak. We will see that in 2012. Only in 2013 will we, will we perhaps see the European economies picking up a little bit. Uh, you, in terms of politics, we still have uh, difficult decisions to make uh, in some European countries where they have to undergo structural reforms, which of course uh, is very uh, difficult. We still have um, unemployment levels which are uh, very high, 11% uh, on an average, very high for, uh, for Europe. And um, even though there are great variations uh, in the European economy, my, my own country, Denmark, uh, is, is doing uh, pretty well and it's a very stable economy. But there's great uh, variations uh, within the European economy. But it, uh, it, is, very, uh, it, is, it is true to say that Europe is, is very challenged um, these years and it will take uh, sometimes and a lot of hard decisions in terms of structural reforms to, to regain our uh, form. I am in no doubt, however, that at some point uh, in 13, uh, we will pick up a little bit of uh, speed again. Um, but economic prospects for Europe are, are dim at uh, the moment. That's my first observation. <coughs> Second observation is this. Um, we have actually done a tremendous lot in Europe to try to overcome this crisis. Sometimes when you look at Europe from the outside, 
Uh, you can't see this decision-making power that we have had in, uh, in Europe, but I would argue that we have taken unprecedented decisions and also decisions that if you had looked at Europe just uh, a year ago, you wouldn't have been able, you wouldn't have uh, predicted the amount of decisions that we have taken at a, taken at a European level to protect uh, the euro and also the European economy. Um, let me uh, give you a few examples. Um, we, have, we are right now carrying on work to establish a banking uh, union. Uh, this uh, includes discussions of a common uh, banking supervision uh, system. Uh, and we have also ha uh, established a rescue fund for, for Europe, uh, the so-called ES, uh, ESM. Um, we have taken bold steps to integrate our economic policies and our policies in general. Um, and we have uh, also allowed for, and we have allowed for new discussions. We are having that this autumn, new discussing of creating new building blocks of further integrating the European Union, both politically and also economically. And uh, only last week we had uh, new decisions which was taken to strengthen the euro. We had uh, the European Central Bank's decision to purchase uh, short-term government bonds, which is, of course, uh, a strengthening uh, of the euro and, and also a completely unprecedented move which will help um, the countries with the highest debt to recover. Of course, this has to go hand in hand with the bold political decisions to uh, tighten up economies and create and take through uh, structural reforms. Uh, but just these examples to carry through the argument that even though from the outside it might look like uh, Europe has not done enough, I will say that we have taken historic decisions over the last uh, year to try to recover uh, the European economy and, of course, uh, the euro. And we have also shown that we are willing to, to go that extra mile to, um, to save uh, the euro. My last observation uh, is the following. Um, we are in this together. A lot of people are looking at Europe and uh, looking at Europe as if we uh, can solve our problems together. As I was arguing before, we have done a lot to try to solve our problem together. We are basically uh, a strong, uh, uh, strong economy in Europe. But I want to be absolutely clear that when Europe is showing its first signs of recovery, which we perhaps will do next year, it is my intense hope that the rest of the world will help uh, push this movement. Uh, this is not only for the benefit of uh, Europe, it will be the, for the benefit of the whole world and the global economy. So my advi advice would be this, when you see the first signs of rec recovery, or perhaps a little bit before, uh, get into Europe, invest in Europe, trade more with Europe, uh, believe that Europe will recover, and I think that will be for the mutual benefit uh, of Europe and the rest of the world, and you are warmly welcome to, be, to engage yourself in, in Europe now and also in the future. Thank you. Thank you. In, in fact, that uh, leads to an interesting next question when we talk about uh, we are in this together. It's not only a European crisis, it's a global crisis because of the impact that Europe has across uh, the rest of the world. So clearly on the, the theme of we're in this together, uh, Dr. Zhu, um, how does this really affect the international role of the euro? The, the inception of that euro, bringing it together as a trading zone, as basically that additional currency that could be traded or, or pegged to, where are we right now in the effects of that and, 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 and the effects of how it's really hitting the rest of the global markets? Um, a lot of concerns about that. Uh, the, you obviously point them out, but uh, I really don't think that's a serious issue. Um, Euro has been playing a very important role in international monetary system. Um, in the past, actually, Euro increased roughly more than 10 percentage point in global reserve uh, 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 system as well. Um, also, Euro will continuously to play a very important role in international reserve system as well. So I think this is a very important uh, point. I understand that people in this room have a lot of Euro in their pocket, and uh, your Euro is safe. I think this is absolutely important. Um, uh, but uh, 
is, as uh, 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 Prime Minister mentioned, so this is still a long way to go. I think that when we talk about the European situation, we try to avoid from the one extreme point. So it's a, it's a huge disaster issue, a crisis. And then to another end, say everything should be okay. I think this is very important. I, I very much agree with you when you say the European has done so many things. And in the past, you mentioned the discussion is very positive and constructive. The discussion follows three areas. The first area is try to bring Greece back to on track. This is very important. And the Greek government made a huge commitment and determined to bring the whole economy back on track. And international communities very much support that. I think that's very constructive. The second issue is to provide a further liquidity to support the market, which is particularly with the ECB's decision, which is also very important. We strongly support that decision. I think it's absolutely important to ease the liquidity uh, uh, tensions in the market. And the third issue is obviously is a long-term discussion on the fiscal pact, on banking union, on the single market building, as uh, um, uh, Prime Minister mentioned. So it is a very positive issues. So uh, I would say overall, the crisis is not over. European still, uh, Euro crisis is still uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the middle of that. There's still a long way to go. But uh, it's moving in the right direction. It's very important. We should have a confidence. And we should have confidence on Europe. I think it's also absolutely important point as well. To follow that up, when you look at some of the decisions you have to make at, at, at the IMF, how does this um, what's happening in the Eurozone affects some of your investments in some of the real growth areas in the emerging markets? Well, uh, we, we don't use the term investments. Okay. Uh, yes. we, we, we do program. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we lend the money to the members if they are, they are in, 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 in crisis situations. We, do, we have a lot of programs. In Europe, currently we have programs in Greece, in, 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 in Portugal, in Ireland, in Iceland, and uh, uh, we have a lot of programs there. We have all the programs in Africa, Latin America, and all other countries uh, as well. Um, we're working very hard uh, uh, in those days in the past, so working with European colleagues, try to make sure uh, the whole issue will move forward. Um, I, 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 as I said, really, the past few weeks, the discussion is very constructive and positive, moving in the right direction. But uh, still, long way to go. I think that's very important. We have to keep that in hand. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Zadil, um, a lot of your work done on the global and emerging and growth markets, similar to that question, how badly is the, is the crisis really affecting those markets and the ability for those gr growth markets to, to invest in trade and, and really how they look at their investments that will go to further trade? Well, um, more generally, we have to say very clearly that the crisis in the European Monetary Union has affected the, the global economy. I don't think any region in the world, any country, any major economy uh, can <clears throat> be absent from the effects of this uh, crisis. If we look uh, at the prospects of growth that we had uh, early <clears throat> uh, last year, and uh, what has happened, we will see that there has been a significant revision downwards of what we thought uh, the global economy could grow uh, looking forward. And I would say that a main explanatory variable of this, uh, what, what is becoming really a double dip, is the situation in Europe. So that has affected the United States, that has affected economies like China, that has affected uh, Latin America. And the reason is very simple. We are interdependent. And there are trade, financial linkages that cannot and should not be avoided. And this is having a real impact on our economies. And that is why I am in agreement with the Prime Minister. We are in this boat together. It's in nobody's interest to see the Euro fail. I think it will be a disaster for Europe, but it will be an equally severe disaster for the global economy at large. Now, having said that, uh, I dare to, to say something. Uh, which uh, really comes from my own Latin American experience. 
we went through a terrible debt crisis back in the 1980s that really translated into what is known as a lost decade. And you forced me to say, why did we pay such a high price? Uh, I would say, well, we pay such a high price because we didn't do what it took to overcome the crisis right away. And I know that politically it was very difficult to do it. But if you wanted to avoid the huge social cost that we pay, then we should have been more forthcoming, more decisive. And I think that is now part of the problem in Europe. I do not diminish the political cost and the courage that uh, leaders in Europe have applied to take what was very well said here have been unprecedented decisions. And that is true, but probably that is not enough. Uh, if you are going to preserve the European Monetary Union, then you have to put on the table all the ingredients that are necessary to have a solid, sustainable, dynamic uh, monetary union. And with all due respect, the way in which this hesitant way to go about this crisis, you know, trying whether something for Greece and Portugal works, uh, trying to see whether guaranteeing uh, or providing direct uh, support to banks from a European uh, fund, uh, announce a fiscal pact, announce the idea that you will have some European supervision system. I agree, individually, all of those things are very important, but they are not uh, sufficient. In fact, I would say that the most significant element that has been put on the table to save the euro only happened a few days ago, when the ECB announced that they will become de facto a lender of last resort. But that's elementary. If you want to have a currency, you need to have a lender of last resort. And for too long, this has been ignored. And only last week, that decision was taken. But you need more than that. Because if you only have the lender of last resort, but you don't do what it takes to have uh, a banking union and to have the necessary steps for a fiscal union to take the necessary steps to consolidate uh, the single market, then I think uh, it will be harder, uh, more painful, uh, more costly, and by the way, you will impose a higher cost in the rest of the world. So and again, I insist, I know the political difficulties, but uh, I think uh, what is at stake, not only in economic terms for Europe, but in economic terms for the world, and I will say for international stability, and I dare to say international peace and security, the euro is a great project. The, mu the euro must be protected, but the Europeans and the rest of the world must take the decisions that are needed to, to validate it. Dr. Zhu, follow up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is an excellent point. When we say the pre previous few weeks discussion moving in the right direction, we should not underestimate the negative impact from Euro crisis to the whole world. I think this is also very important because... So it's not just contained right in Europe exactly, at all. Exactly, because right. the European obviously is still the, the largest economic entity in the world. And uh, through few channels, number one, uh, the fa uh, financial market volatilities, the confidence and particularly the weaker growth, because we forecast uh, your era will have a minor recession, which is negative growth, which will have a profound impact for the, 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 a lot of regions, for example, in Asia, in this region, and the uh, European market roughly account one third of the net exports, I mean value added uh, exports. So when the, the growth in the European area dropped to zero, and you will see export growth from this region drop to zero too. So I, I think this is, this is also very important. We further did the simulations. If the European crisis really deteriorating further become a disaster, it would be a huge negative impact for the world. For example, 
the negative impact on growth for European area can as big as to five to six percent of GDP. For US and Japan and other areas, can be 1.5 percent to two percent of GDP, and also can have around the one percent negative impact on the growth on China. Obviously, for China, good news is China still have a lot of policy space can mitigate this impact, but the negative impact is quite big. So in that sense, I absolutely agree with you. When we say the European is working hard, moving into the right direction, they have to do more. Number one, and I agree with you, the whole world should support. It's also equally important. Prime Minister Thorning Schmidt. Yeah, I just um, got a little bit um, inspired and perhaps a little bit provoked as well by what was said that Europe um, needs to do more. We need to do it faster. And we need to have more decision-making power. Because everyone is agreeing that what we have done is right, but we have done it too slowly. And to a certain extent, that is true. But I think it is extremely important to understand what Europe is. Europe is not a country. Europe is many countries trying to work our way uh, together. And in my ears, it sounds a little bit like you are asking a horse to fly. <laughs> when you are asking Europe to take all these kind of decisions in a very rapid way. So my hope for this discussion and the general discussion in the, in the world is that the steps that we have actually taken, even though slow, even though it's not always pretty the way we take decisions, which it certainly isn't, that it will still be recognized that we have come very far and that the results that we have now produced would be unthinkable just a year ago. And my, the reason why I'm saying that is that we, we, we must avoid being lost in slagging off Europe, saying we should be done, done more faster, and actually try to appreciate what we have done and take that as a starting point and say the Europeans have shown real determination to uh, exit the crisis. Prime Minister uh, um, when you look at how this could stall growth and we, we look at 2012 looking as though some of the countries will fall into recession in, in, in Europe, having a chance of maybe seeing some growth out of 2013 and then using this discussion about, uh, if I could use the, the terms, how bold should you be versus how you have to watch out for all of the, 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 real, the realities of it not being one country, is there enough or should we do more to try to get Europe as an economy not falling into that recession that, that is almost seeming um, a distinct possibility? And how much does the ECB and their role play in that? Uh, well, uh, we seem to be discussing here uh, just uh, one uh, part of the issue. So we have a debt crisis. What can we do? We can... Uh, uh, print more money, everybody wants it, we can uh, 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 pay from ESM uh, directly to the banks, everybody wants this as well, we can uh, do this and we can do that. And, uh, but uh, I think there are a couple of uh, fundamental questions. So first of all, why do we have a debt crisis? We probably have a debt crisis because we have too much debt. And we know that master criteria is... Uh, 60% of GDP of public debt, and the uh, Eurozone is moving somewhere from 80 to 90% on average. So, uh, and therefore, I think where we need more action and where we need to act more boldly is uh, to reduce uh, the budget deficits and actually to get uh, uh, the fiscal position of Eurozone countries uh, in, uh, uh, in order. And... Uh, of course, there are many court arguments to this saying, yeah, uh, if we do more austerity, then we uh, have even less growth if, or even recession. If we have recession, we need more austerity. So we are lost, so there is no way out of it. Well, uh, but uh, what probably uh, uh, Europe and Eurozone really need, something we tried to term, uh, 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 coin a term for this together with my Finnish colleague, Jyrki Katainen, the spring, uh, which would, could be called growth austerity. And uh, if you remember some uh, uh, three, four years ago, nobody was discussing uh, Eurozone crisis. 
but uh, everybody was discussing Latvia's crisis. So what, uh, what I can say in a case of Latvia, so far we have done most fiscal adjustment in EU 27, and yet we are currently fastest growing EU economy. Last year we had 5.5% growth, this year first half we had 5.9% growth, which is quite good by nowadays uh, European standards. And uh, so probably, which uh, this also means that there is not so much contradiction between growth and, uh, and austerity. And I may give some uh, reasoning behind it. Because if you are in a position where financial markets do not trust you, uh, it's better to act quickly to restore the trust of financial markets. And it's not only to uh, finance the sovereign debt, but it's also to finance... Uh, uh, basically, if you don't have this trust of the uh, uh, financial system, what's happened? Banks are not lending to your citizens or businesses. Businesses are worried they are not investing. Citizens are worried they are not spending. And you are just getting deeper into recession despite having large budget deficit, which should supposedly be uh, fiscal stimulus. And if you return this trust of financial markets, if you do the necessary adjustment, all the opposite things start to happen. Uh, banks start lending, uh, companies start investing, citizens start spending. It's possible to attract foreign investment and economy starts growing. That's exactly what we experienced in Latvia. And I, I can say that uh, we so far have done uh, most austerity in uh, EU 27. We have done uh, between 2008 and uh, 2012, indeed, we have done 17% of GDP fiscal adjustment. And yet, as I said, we are fastest growing EU economy. So really, there is not so much contradiction. So it's important really for the countries which are affected by the debt crisis to act quickly, to act boldly, and to uh, get their uh, financial position on track. Because otherwise, uh, it, it will just continue because uh, then if the country says we don't like austerity, that's fine. But then you need to answer another question, who is going to finance this lack of austerity? Financial markets are clearly not in the mood, so you can print money, but uh, this can be a short-term solution. But so far, I must say, euro as a currency has stayed remarkably well. It has maintained its share as a reserve, as a global reserve currency. It has uh, stayed relatively stable vis-a-vis -vis US dollar. Well, it's now gradually going down, down, but very gradually. So there is no, basically market is not questioning euro as a currency. So while dealing with a debt crisis, I think we should not use too much instruments which would make markets to question euro as a currency. And that's why we are back to the very same issue of the need of real adjustment, of the need of structural reforms to boost the competitiveness. Because high levels of wealth cannot be maintained without high levels of competitiveness, as, by the way, uh, EU uh, 2020 competitive re report uh, clearly states. So I think those are the things we need uh, to really concentrate on. Dr. Zudio, comment on that? Well, uh, I wish, no, I don't wish that that southern European countries had uh, wage uh, flexibility and exchange rate flexibility at Latvia has, and then the problem will be much easier to solve. But that is not the case. We are where we are. And I wish also that uh, uh, the problem were simply one of a debt crisis. It isn't. I mean, uh, there is a debt problem which is a manifestation of a broader crisis, but fundamentally what is at stake here is whether or not you keep together uh, or you keep uh, the European Monetary Union. And therefore you need more than the fiscal discipline, which I agree, I am a, a fiscal uh, hawkish uh, person, but I think you need much more than that and you need things that don't depend only on the capacity of each country to ex execute uh, their policies. I mentioned before, you need to put on the table the necessary ingredients to validate 
the European Monetary Union. One component, very important, was this question of, la of lender of last resort. Why is it important? You know what has been bleeding the Spanish economy, for example? There is, of course, fiscal austerity that they needed, and they have been applying. Uh, but what has really bleed in the Spanish economy this year is capital flight. And it's capital flight because people believe that one euro deposited in Madrid is not the same as a euro deposited in Frankfurt. Therefore, they have capital flight that has dry up credit, and that has had a dramatic impact on the real sectors of the economy. So if you don't address the lender of last resort, the solvency of the banks, and the solvency of the sovereign debt, then you are in deep trouble. And by the way, you also need to address very clearly the structural problems of the Spanish economy that uh, are to be addressed to enhance the competitiveness and the productivity of the Spanish economy. So the recipe is very complex. And I am afraid that we have here a sequential problem. If you try to do one thing after the other, you know, uh, very cautiously, you may find at the end that the cost that you have to pay is considerably much higher. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at the end, Germany will end up paying a much higher price to keep the euro alive than if they had taken the necessary decisions more at front. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah, I'm, uh, I always agree with my good friends, Mr. President, but not today. And uh, <laughs> a slice, a little more optimistic than, than, than you are. Latvia provides a wonderful case. Through the fiscal devaluation, you will be able to cut the wage more than 30%. You will be able to bring the deficits down and bring the growth back to positive only in roughly three, less than three years. So this means there's a lot of policy instruments, a lot of policy space, a lot of things the government can do. And the promoter growth, obviously, in that we agree with you, obviously is the top priority for the European countries as well, as well so I think there's no doubt about that. But we had a study, we just released a report a few weeks ago. We studied the European growth, we realized if the European can do the structural reform through the labor market reform, legal system reform, and uh, furthermore, single market formations allow the, 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 the tradable uh, retail business to go within the areas, we'll be able to create a 4.4% of GDP in four years of horizon, which is not a trivial. It's not a trivial. So a lot of efforts also need to put into the structural reform to promote the growth. And uh, there's a living example. Things can be done. Um, along those lines, we want to make sure that, um, yep, this is a um, definite issue with inside the Eurozone. I'd like your comments specifically on, back to that stalling in the Eurozone, how much effect will it have on the U.S. economy? How much effect will it have on Latin America? The uncertainty of not being able to come up with a plan that is articulated, whether it be one or another, in some uh, meetings I've been in, some are saying it doesn't matter. Pick one so that we can, we, we, we can plan on it and start our own growth in other parts of the region. Give us some view on, on how the rest of the world is waiting for Europe to come up with at least a plan to start implementing it. Well, this is exactly as uh, my good friends, Mr. President, and the Prime Minister mentioned. We are living in such an interconnected world. So uh, the European crisis obviously has a big impact on the global economic as well. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, uh, for this region, it's kind of one-third of net exports. So when the growth in the Europe dropped to uh, zero, the export growth in this region, I mean the Asia region, not only in China, dropped to zero. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, we did the simulation, and the negative impact can be quite a big if we cannot contain the risk of further the things deteriorating. For example, it can roughly around 1.5 to 2 percent negative GDP growth on the U.S. and also 1 to 1.5 percent negative growth on China as well. So this is a quite a big issue. Uh, so in that sense, the whole world needs help and support Europe and uh, make sure they will go back to the growth pack. So these are two issues. One issue is the financial crisis, the euro crisis, on the liquidity issues on the financial sectors, but also more important for the whole world 
on the growth side. I think that when we talk about Europe, we always talk about the financial side for the Euro crisis, talk about collapse of the system, which I don't believe it will happen. But we don't talk more on the growth side, which in fact is the growth side has a much more profound impact on the global economies. If a globe, but this is not only risk for the whole world, let me point out also. We're facing four major risks for the global economic situation today. The first, obviously, the European uh, Euro crisis is still the top, as I mentioned. The second issue is the uh, US uh, fiscal cliffs. Uh, because the total, the budgetary uh, uh, package is roughly 4.3% of GDP. It's a huge. If it's a 4.3% the budgetary tax package it move off the table right after election, the U.S. will run, run into recession, the whole world will run into recession. Currently, obviously, a lot of discussions, I don't think it's 4.3 will one time move off the table. They'll compromise something, but it's not all clear what will be the consequence the results, which create a huge uncertainty. I would say this is also important risk of the world because the U.S. remaining the largest economy in the world is absolutely also important. The third risk we're also facing is the emerging market hard landing. The growth of jobs, jobs are actually much more than people thought. For example, Chinese economic growth from 10.4, roughly from 9.0% last year, and roughly this year, it's around 8%. India, 10.8%. In, in, in year 10, dropped last year, and roughly 7.8 this year, 5.5. And Brazil, from 6.7% to 2.7%, and, and this year probably will be 2%. So whether the emerging market will be able to soften and hold on growth, I think this has also become an issue because emerging market and end of this year in the low-income country will account for 50% of global GDP, PPP measure. So it's absolutely important for the global stabilization. The fourth risk we're facing today is the food price. Food price increased dramatically because the drought in the Middle West of the US and also in the Black Sea areas and the Masoon in India is not particularly strong this year. So we saw soybean price increase 47%. We saw wheat price increase 29%. We saw corn price increase 28% already this year. And we saw rice price increase 8%. So if you're looking for the corn price and the soybean price, they are in the 2008, the peak, the crisis times already. Although the wheat and the rice price is still two thirds, but obviously the food price has a huge impact on the whole world, and particularly on the low income countries as well. So we need the policy to prohibit the trade war. We carefully monitor financial market to make sure there's no financial market manipulations in the speculative activities as well. So the whole world is facing a quite a few risks, I would say, this year. So the growth is really on downsides, and uh, it growth is slowing down, and the risk is still on downside. Let me go back. The euro crisis is still the top, but it's not the only crisis or risk. Uh, as well. I think we should see the whole picture. I think that's also important. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I wish it was more energizing because if we could, if we solve one, there's still three more large <laughs> ones coming is what you're saying. So um, well, we also with, need to give, give European credit. Yeah. Thank you. The European have been working so hard. That's very true, <laughs> right? I mean, the horse cannot fly, but the horse want to fly. So, <laughs> we, but we at least try to push the horse to run very fast. It can gallop. <laughs> right. it, the horse can gallop is maybe what it is. So what we're going to do now is open up questions. Um, if we maybe turn the, hi, the, the house lights up a little, and I believe there are some people with um, some microphones. So we'll start here on the, in, the, in, the, in the front, and then we'll move around to the back. And if you could just uh, make sure that you uh, address the, who you'd like the question to be answered by. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tatsuo Master from Nagoya University of Commerce and Business, Japan. I have a question to Mr. Minzu. In meeting any crisis, what, what is important for policymakers is to imagine, imagine what is the worst case scenario. And if worst case scenario is shared about 
fellow leaders, then there will be concrete steps uh, to avoid from that happening. In the case of Fukushima nuclear disaster, the government failed to imagine the worst case scenario, so measures they have taken has been sort of patchwork measures, which deteriorated the situation. So from your point of view, standing in the middle in the panel, what is your worst case scenario if things go wrong in Europe and elsewhere? And would that worst case scenario really be shared among top leaders in Europe? Thank you. Thank you. You are really pushing me hard. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I, I told all you already, the worst situation if the European crisis further deteriorated, as I mentioned, we had a simulation, we'll say it created a negative 6% GDP drops for a European area. Roughly 1.5 to 2% for US, and 1 to 1.5% for China, and Japan is between, since you come from Japan, roughly a little bit of less than 2% negative GDP impact. But obviously, this is a tail risk. I agree with you. It's absolutely important to see the tail risk so you can prepare to avoid the tail risk. And also, I'm very, very, very happy to report to you and that we share this tail risk with all the political leaders around the world, the people understand the situation. So that's the reason the whole world is working together to support Europe, to avoid the tail risk. And also, I'm very happy to say today, the whole Europe is moving into the right direction to avoid that tail risk situation, which is very positive. Okay, thanks. Ne next question. Let's get some in the back and then we'll work more towards the front, right here. Gentleman in the white. What? Hello, I have a question for Mr. Zhu Ming, the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. The question goes to Mr. Zhu Ming. Several Chinese economists believe that the origin of the Eurozone crisis lies with the Euro. That is to say, the EU has only a, a consistent or integrated um, economic policy without the coordination of its uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy, so it would be very challenging for the EU to meet its overall economic development goals. So it is very likely that the Eurozone will collapse. Since I'm Chinese, I'll ask your question in Chinese. The first part of your question is correct. Part of the reason for the euro crisis is uh, that uh, the crisis is partially caused by the euro, but it is not entirely because of the euro. The euro zone is moving toward integrated, and consistent uh, fiscal policy coordination. We have raised the concept of the fiscal pact and the banking union. All these solutions are moving towards integration and consistent and coordinated fiscal policy. So the EU is moving in the right direction. So I don't believe the euro will collapse or disappear. So and I encourage all of you to have confidence in the euro like I do. Back up here towards the front, please. Question for Dr. Zhu. Oh, come uh, on, Daniel. You should not ask me questions. We have yes, a prime please, minister here. Please, so. please spread them around. <laughs> exactly, well, Daniel. Maybe, maybe for you and Ernesto, I think, who would be the two ones to take these questions. Uh, you've described, obviously, the, the numbers, uh, the downturn that will uh, be for Asia, the U.S., with the problems in Europe. You listed along that there are a set of other problems. Let me ask you two experts, particularly, of course, the others may want to join too. What are the two or three, four things that the United States and China ought to be doing both to protect their own economies and to contribute to bolstering global growth? Dr. Zizel? Well, uh, Dan, let me try to figure out uh, a good sequence uh, of events uh, and then 
try to see what is the role that those players have to play. I mean, uh, for things to work out uh, in Europe, I think uh, our European friends have to be more aggressively uh, on uh, the question of uh, banking union, on the question of fiscal federalism. I'm not saying that tomorrow they will have it, but they have to move uh, faster in that direction. And of course, more urgently to address uh, these uh, problems that are causing capital flight in countries like Spain, like in Greece, uh, and eventually could happen, or rather soon, in Italy. Uh, now, they also have to do their homework internally. Part of that is this internal devaluation, or fiscal devaluation, that uh, Shumin was uh, talking about, because they need to be more competitive. Because from now on, and for many years, those countries will not have the excess of foreign savings that they had in previous years. Spain had a, a current account deficit of 10% of GDP, now it's down to 3%, but even that is hardly financiable. Now, assuming that the euro doesn't collapse, and I think it will not collapse, then Germany will have to have a more expansive fiscal policy. And actually, the European Central Bank, that now is saying is a lender of last resort, in my view, will have to have an even more accommodative monetary policy in order to help these countries that have very low negative growth in Europe to move a little bit faster and avoid a political and social condition that will not make them viable. So let's say at the end of that process, I think we will see a weaker euro. And we will see a Europe that needs to have a current account surplus. And at that moment, I think we will need our Chinese friends and our American friends not to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is a beggar thy neighbor policy. And we need to do something to counterbalance your own policy. And I think at some point, the United States and China will have to recognize that there is in their own interest to allow Europe, and by the way, Germany, to have a current account surplus that is substantially larger than the present one. Because otherwise, those countries uh, will have, that are now suffering in Europe, will be suffering something that may be unbearable and would make it political and uh, unviable to sustain the, the situation. Dr. Yeah, Daniel, to uh, uh, directly answer your questions, I think that the top issue for US is to solve this uh, fiscal cliff on also provide uh, the transparency to the whole world. As I said, I don't think it will happen all 4.3% of the US GDP will move off the table uh, at once. But uh, it's not all clear what will happen. So uh, US really need working hard to avoid this fiscal cliff and also uh, provide transparency to the world. I think that's very important. For China, uh, we'll say the stabilized growth is the top of priority. It will be greatly help the whole world. So that's the reason we support the Chinese government. It's a little funny. I'm a Chinese, but when they say way, that means the font, and uh, I have to distinguish this slight different. We support the Chinese government the policy, further easing, and the, the the policy to support the growth, because the stabilized Chinese growth today play a very important role for the whole world. Through our spillover studies, China has a very important spillover impact for not only for the region, but for many countries in Latin America, Brazil, Chile, Argentina as well, and also on US and uh, on the European countries as well. Stabilize growth, but also don't forget the structural reform. The care on the structural reform, I think this is the top priority for the Chinese economy and to contribute to global economic stabilization and growth. Okay, thank you. I, I recognize there's a, a lot more questions and hopefully the panelists will have some time after, but we wanted to, to just finish with some key thoughts from each of the panelists, really focusing in two areas, just re very succinct, one or two key insights, maybe of what you've already talked about or a takeaway from some of the things we've had today. And then one of my own, which is, do you think that 
this will create more unity or more division within the Eurozone as we work through some of these challenges? Um, well, two observations uh, in that uh, regard. Uh, first of all, I think we have established, because it's also been part of the discussion here today, that we are we're in this together. And I think it is uh, important to take with us that Europe is acting. We have shown that we, are, we want to save the euro, but you should never expect that Europe moves extremely fast. We will always model through. This is what we have done uh, since uh, the European Union was, to, was together. We will model, model, uh, model through, and there will be incremental steps to, to take the right decisions. And that's how Europe will, has always worked, and that's how Europe will work in the future. Uh, that's my first point. Second point is, don't give up on Europe. Because Europe, uh, as we have also heard today, talking about the Latvian example, that's my own country, Denmark, we have uh, taken through massive uh, structural reforms. We have a good economy. Uh, we have almost negative interest rate uh, these days. So don't give up um, on, on Europe. There are being, uh, our structural reforms are carried through. And there's also a difference uh, in the European uh, economies. So that's, uh, that's my uh, second point. The last point is... Um, and connected to this, don't give up on Europe. It is important to understand that when Europe is recovering, which we will be, I think we'll have slight, slight growth rates next uh, year, come to Europe, trade with Europe, invest in Europe uh, again. This is uh, what we need. And, and don't forget that Europe is still uh, the strongest, uh, as, as seen together, Europe is still the strongest economy uh, in the world. We still have a lot uh, to offer the world. Uh, and I hope that, that new eyes will be set uh, on Europe. We can recover, and I think we will. Dr. Zhou. With your very strong uh, voice, I'm sure a lot of investments and the money will go to Denmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> so, idea. So, yeah, so you should <laughs> pay rent for Tianjin government. <laughs> <laughs> you have an absolutely important point. I would say all the policy today working together move into the unity. <clears throat> Banking unit, fiscal pack, sing, single market, everything moving to the director. But there's a one concern. The, if you're looking for the real economy, the diverging about the productivity between the north and the south remain and widen. Because Denmark is a very good case. You're, you're part of northern Europe. You're doing very well. Because at the end of the day, if you want to bring the economy together, you want to see the productivity more or less the same. So when all the policies move into the unity, we're going to be paying more attention and promote the growth and increase productivity in the southern area. I think that's a very important challenge for the area. And the world also got to help, as you mentioned. Prime Minister Dombowski. Well, uh, uh, as I already mentioned in the beginning, I think there are two aspects in this uh, crisis which both are being uh, dealt with. Uh, one is uh, more medium-term aspect on uh, ensuring that Eurozone is and uh, EU in general is uh, sticking with a uh, fiscal discipline and getting its uh, finances in order. Another is immediate efforts to deal with uh, those countries affected by current crisis, where I think now there are enough instruments with the FSF, with the SM, and just recently ECB pulling out the big bazooka. So, uh, but then uh, another aspect which we need to think of is uh, to sustain growth. We need to sustain competitiveness, and a couple of aspects have been mentioned uh, here already on uh, flexibility of labor markets, on uh, using full potential of EU internal market, of creating a uh, truly digital single market, of concentrating more on even innovations and research. And interestingly, just some half a year ago or so, together with Prime Minister Torning Schmidt and 10 other heads of state and government, we submitted a, a paper to our European colleagues outlining exactly those issues as a priorities to uh, get Europe's economy back to sustainable growth once again. So there are many uh, things to be done, uh, and uh, I think we are well on track to do 
uh, those things. And uh, if I may some, uh, give some personal forecast, I, I would expect still some uh, bumpy couple of months or probably half a year ahead, uh, especially to sort out the situation in Greece. But from then on, you can already start to see this uh, turning point uh, coming with uh, growth starting to recover. And that's, I think, a, a real a good moment for uh, us uh, to work all together with Europe, with US, with uh, China, with other emerging economies uh, to make sure that uh, we support each other, we sustain each other and uh, return uh, the world back to the sustainable growth. Thank you. Dr. Zidil. Well, first, my, not only my wish, by, but my conviction that uh, the euro will stay, will survive, uh, that eventually the economic situation in Europe will get better. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that the sooner the European leaders stop being behind the curve and try to move ahead of the curve, the less painful the adjustment uh, will be. And I think uh, it will happen. They have to recognize that uh, markets actually don't have a heart and have very strong and very fast legs. <laughs> uh, because, you know, it's, it's important to tell people, listen, what we are doing. Look uh, how politically difficult this was. Look what a big effort we are doing. That was our Latin American experience. I spent very, uh, a substantial part of my professional life doing that, doing road shows and trying to convince. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, only decisive, significant, profound uh, policy decisions is uh, what counts. Uh, again, I don't diminish what has been done in Europe, but uh, they will have to do more. And I am afraid that my friend Xu Min, uh, as part of the Troika, uh, of the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the IMF will have to do a lot of work in Europe, uh, in some countries, in these and uh, coming years. That's my forecast. Assuming we'll work a lot in Europe. Well, we we shall take your order properly. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank the panel for all of their insight on this important topic, and they may be available after for some questions. So thank you very much.